Well, thank you, Wes, and thank you, band, and uh, orchestra and choir for bringing us such a great worship time this morning, and uh, appreciate that so much. Galatians chapter 2 is where we find ourselves. We're concluding this morning the series of messages, four-part series on No Other Gospel, and next week, as Wes said, we'll be continuing uh, this series through the book of Galatians, but a, really a new title for the whole series in chapters 3 and 4, and that's Nothing But Grace. Same book, a little different emphasis as we move through the book. Well, Galatians chapter 2 is where we find ourselves this morning, and in verse 11. And let me just share a story with you, and it's been a while maybe since I preached on um, uh, the family and raising children, but one of my favorite uh, illustrations is when I talk about how we need to uh, teach our children to stand alone and when they're outnumbered. The story is one of Ruth Baranda, who did a survey of many, many different schools all across the country. This was the experiment. The experiment was just simply this. She would walk into a classroom filled with about 10 children. Nine of them would be part of the experiment. They would know what's going on. The 10th one did not. And she would draw three lines on the board. Letter A was short, very short. Letter B, or, or yeah, letter, line B was very long. And the third one, C, was about half as long, maybe a little more than half as long as line B. Then she would ask the class, which line is the longest? Well, it's obvious line B was the longest. But the nine who knew about the experiment would say, it's C. They would all raise their hands for C. The stooge, hate to say that, <clears throat> but that's what she called it, it wasn't me, right her. And so the stooge would then look around the room and sheepishly raise their hand for line C. In spite of the fact they knew line B was the longest one. And when they surveyed elementary school, middle school, high school, all the way through school, they found that 75% of the young people that were the stooges voted for the wrong line because they did not have the courage to challenge the group. Now, I go on to say in, in those messages, or that message, that simply, if we do not teach our children to stand alone, then it doesn't matter really what else we teach them because they're going to go the other way. But it's not just young people, is it? Remember the story I told you about Jay Strack? He came to um, our man fire, which is a great event, and uh, he shared his testimony, and he shared a story where Bob, who was one of the many uh, men in his life that his mother either was married to or lived with, was living with them at the time. He was the first one to throw ball with him, throw, throw, play catch. He finally felt like he had a dad. Remember that story just a few weeks ago? He went into the, uh, Bob was in the bar. Jay goes into the bar and said, would you please come home? Please don't leave us. Please come home and be my daddy. And he told him, he says, if you get down on your knees and beg me, I'll come home and be your daddy. And so he got down on his knees, eight years old, and begged Bob to be his daddy. And all the people in the bar was, oh, Bob, be my daddy too, be my daddy too. And the peer pressure, everybody in the bar was looking at Bob. And he told Jay he's not coming home with him and to get out of the bar. Really affected his life, you can imagine. But Bob could, did not have the courage to stand against the crowd even though he was really fond of Jay, probably deep down. He did not have the courage to stand against the crowd. Now, we're looking at the gospel of Christ, nothing but the gospel or no other gospel, and we've determined what that gospel is according to the Bible. And the Bible simply says that we're all sinners separated from God. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins, and we must individually receive him in order to become a believer in Christ. Now, there was a group, a sect, if you remember, in Galatia that was preaching something different, another gospel. And in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says it's not even another gospel. It's not a gospel at all. Now, here's the thing about the Judaizers. 
the Judaizers believed that God loved them and everybody else. The Judaizers believed that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins because we're all sinners. The Judaizers believed that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. What they could not believe and did not believe and did not preach was how a person comes in relationship with God. They were adding to the gospel. And because of that, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Galatia. And he was right, not writing to the Judaizers, but those who were listening to the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were not only saying something about the message, but even the messenger, as we looked at last week. But now, we, we, just, we see an, uh, an instance where Paul is again looking back in history. If you remember, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says 14 years later. He's in the middle of his testimony, and he says, now 14 years later. Well, now in verse 11, he's moving on to Antioch, another meeting altogether with the apostle Peter and others. And as he's moving to this, we understand as he's there in Antioch, which is modern-day Syria, and by the way, we need to be praying for that region, Turkey, all the, earth, the earthquake that happened. And in fact, Galatia is modern-day Turkey. And so we look at this time in Antioch, beginning in verse 11. Let's read it, just the first few verses. But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can we force the Gentiles to live like Jews. Well, we open up this passage and we see what is developing here. And so I want us to look at standing for the gospel with the problem, the pressure, and the path. First of all, let's look at the setting of it all, the problem. We find here that Cephas, who is called Peter, is in Antioch. Now, the Bible says in Acts that, the, that we were first called Christians in Antioch. And so this is a very strategic city, and it was filled with Gentiles. That's basically all that was there. And so they were preaching to the Gentiles. They were uh, among the churches of the Gentiles, which is the non everybody that's a, a non-Jew. And so now the Judaizers who believed wrongly, he was simply defending himself and saying, not only this, but I had to go back to Antioch and even rebuke Peter and restore him. Notice what it says. He said that, I, I said this to his face right in front of everybody. Why? Because it was a public sin. If, if he were to handle this one privately at this time, then no one would have known anything. Oh, it must be okay to shun the, the, the uh, Gentiles when the Jewish people are around. Must be okay. No, he had to address it publicly. And he says here, he said, I stood in his face because he stood condemned. That doesn't mean that Peter was condemned in judgment to, to hell. It just simply means he was convicted. He was caught. He was caught. And Paul now was calling him out. And he says in verse 12, for certain men came from James. He was eating with the Gentiles, so forth and so on. But I want you to get down to verse 14 very quickly. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, here was the accusation. Here was the accusation to the Judaizers and to those who were also in Antioch that day. They were not in line. Their conduct was not in line with the gospel. And this means that in alignment, like a car alignment, for example, your, your car, if you ever get your tires changed or you've you got a tune-up going on or something, they always tell you the same thing. Your tires are out of alignment. I mean, what are you going to say, right? Your tires are out of alignment. But what happens when they're really out of alignment? The car pulls to the left. Maybe it pulls to the right. The tires wear in a weird way. Sometimes you get up to a, a higher speed 
you know, 50, even 50, 60 miles an hour, it starts vibrating. They don't, the car doesn't run right. You know, it's, it's sort of like an alignment, like a, a hip alignment. You know, your, your hip's out of joint. Now, I never had that. I don't know what they pulled to the right or pulled to the left. I don't know. But you know that's got to be kind of painful. And this was the charge. Your conduct, what you say you believe, is not in alignment with the gospel. Now, what, did, what is the gospel? We've said, first, this is the order right here. You believe the gospel, you are immediately saved, and then you have the power through the Holy Spirit, which we'll get into next week, the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. That's the alignment. That's the order. The Judaizers were saying, first you believe on Christ. They believed all, all the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was not an issue. First you believe on Christ, then you obey the law, then salvation follows. Now, I don't know how much you would have to obey the law to know that you're saved. What is the passing grade? But here we find one writer, and I don't know how he would know this. In fact, he wouldn't know this. One writer said that he believed that through his ministry and his worldwide travels that 90% of the people of the world believe like the Judaizers believe. And I, I don't think it's 90%. I don't know. It could be 95, could be 75 but certainly a massive amount of people would identify with the Judaizers. Of course, of course you need to live the Christian life. We have people today. In fact, my generation, it was like, you remember it? You give an invitation and people come forward. They fill out a card. They sit on the front pew. That's what I did. They filled out a card on me and I was saved. And I thought to myself, that is not right. That just can't be all there is. And so I, I, I went to Prince Avenue Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia, and my pastor, my future pastor, Bill Ricketts, prayed the prayer of salvation. And all of a sudden, yeah, that's what you need to do. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. The problem is with that is a lot of people, of course, prayed the prayer and really aren't saved because they didn't really mean the prayer. There was no repentance, and so there's no life change. So the next generation comes along and says, you can't simply just pray a prayer and be saved. People have asked me that. Pastor, you don't, you don't believe a person, all I have to do is pray a prayer to get saved. Oh, yeah, I do. That's what the Bible says. But see, when you do that, you're a new creature in Christ as the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside your heart. And so what happens is, therefore, you've got to, you, I don't know, you've got to feed the, feed the poor. You've got to live it. You, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. You, you, you can't do this. You can't do that. You've got to show that you're really a Christian before you're really saved. And we begin to add to the gospel because so many people pray the prayer in every generation or pray asking Christ, or it doesn't maybe have to be a prayer, just a, a surrender of the heart. But it doesn't work with them because they didn't really mean it. And so we, we find this maybe even with the Judaizers, but they were out of alignment. And so look at what happened to Peter. Let's look at the pressure. He says in verse 12, for being certain men came from James. Now, the significance of that was they came from Jerusalem. They were Jewish people. James was the leader, maybe of the whole early church, but certainly he was the leader of the most important strategic church and all of Christendom in the first century, and that is the, the church at Jerusalem. The brother of Jesus was that leader. And so when it says they sent from James, it meant the Jewish people came from Jerusalem. Now, if you remember the story last week in chapter 2, verse 1, 14 years later, they met in Jerusalem, met, they met private, at, privately, and they decided that no, the Gentiles do not have to become Jews first. Or even in the process of becoming a Christian, you don't have to be circumcised. And so years later in Antioch, they're having the same type of situation. He says, from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Cephas, or Peter, another name for Peter was Cephas. Peter was eating with the Gentiles. In fact, if we were to study our biblical history just a little bit, we would find out that through a vision that Peter had back in Acts chapter 10, he was called to go and minister to the Gentiles. He is the very first evangelist, the first preacher, the first witness to Cornelius and the Gentile generation. And so the very first 
Christians that were ever saved from a non-Jewish background, Peter led them to the Lord. He backed them up in Jerusalem as well. He was eating with them in Antioch. He was fellowshipping with them. And by the way, in the New Testament times, the way that you embrace someone is by eating with them. And if you refuse to eat with them, you are shunning them. You were putting them at arm, arm's length. You were not in fellowship with them. And so Cephas, or Peter, was eating with the Gentiles. But, but, when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. He said the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. The word hypocrite actually comes from the word acting. Uh, back uh, in, um, before even biblical times, a person would wear a mask, and the mask would be in character with the character that he was playing in the act. And so it, they were a hypocrite. And so it came to mean someone who was professing one thing and acting like something else. And that's what they were doing. He says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically, but, but when, I, he said, even Barnabas. Now Barnabas was the guy that disciple Paul. He said, even my friend Barnabas, who I went on this missionary journey with to Galatia, he was doing the same thing. They were, they were just shunning. Can you imagine the hurt feelings that were involved in that? Here, we were all part of them, and now somebody else comes along, and they won't even talk to us, won't eat with us. What was the problem here? The problem and the, and the pressure, as Paul was confronting him, the reason for it all was peer pressure. Peer pressure. I don't want to stand alone in the crowd. I don't want to be ostracized from the group. Again, I, I try to teach my children how to stand alone. I don't know how, I mean, successful you are at anything really, but, but I, I believe that that was one of the main things I taught them. And I remember my six-year-old coming home from elementary school, Brandon, who's preached here before. And he said, you know, they were out on the playground and he was telling me about it. He said, Dad, I was standing alone. I said, well, great, son. Great. You know, I was standing alone, Dad. And I said, wonderful. He said, Dad, what does it mean to stand alone? <laughs> I guess he thought, you know, I'm out on the playground, I'm by myself. Dad wouldn't really be proud of me. So what does it mean to really stand alone. Well, again, one of the greatest fears is to be ostracized from the group. In fact, all of us uh, want to think ourselves as these great individualists. You know, the cowboys that go out west and, you know, all I know is they were wearing the same cowboy hats and had a six gun on their side. They all looked alike to me. And what about the hippie movement? I bring them up again because of the uh, Jesus film coming out. <clears throat> they were supposed to be to wait on that. But hey, guys, go back a little bit, okay? All right? I appreciate it. All right, so um, they, uh, okay, they insist. I told them the key word was picture, but, you know, anyway. Here we have some uh, pictures of these, these hippie guys. Now, you can tell by them that they were individuals. <laughs> they were re rebels against everybody else. You can uh, this guy, this is not the same guy, by the way. I just let you know that. They all looked alike. They dressed alike. And you say, well, it's different in this generation, but, and yet uh, the pastors under 40, for example, um, they, they are individuals, right? They're authentic. They're authentic. That's the key word. They are different from everybody else. Well, let's show a few pictures of, of those guys, okay? Let's throw that up there if you don't mind. There we go. Now, they look just like, and there's several of these, there's a few of them that actually have the same name, first and last. We, we couldn't believe that. But anyway, you, you see some of these guys, one or two of them you even may recognize, and they, they all look alike, probably have holes in the same places in their jeans, <laughs> things like that. And of course, the older generation was not like that at all. I mean, my goodness, we've got a few pictures of them, and you see how they were so different than everybody else. Same hairdo, you know, same suits, everything was the same. You say, well, you know, pastor, you're really not talking about that. No, that's just a, a little symptom of something much, much deeper that's much more alarming, and that is 
that we want to conform to what everybody else is doing around us so that we don't get ostracized from the group. Peter was thinking to himself, wow, what are they going to think of me eating with the Gentiles? I'm going to lose fellowship with all these people that I, are important in my life. And whether it's in school, whether it's in work, we tend to, to bend to the peer pressures. And if we're not careful, the values of our society, beauty, brains, brawn, the bucks, with the same idols before us, power and pleasure, can the church withstand that kind of pressure? We all need that community in Christ, every single one of us. So I'm not saying you have to dress differently or anything like that. That was just sort of, a, like I said, the tip of the iceberg. But what about the underlining things? What about a, a pastor's falling when substance abuse is, is involved? Accepted substance abuse, abuse among many. What happens when you and I say, well, I've got to have this thing in my life in order to have joy in my life, and everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is, is there. What about doing some of the things that you say, well, it won't hurt at all. It's, it's all good. You heard the story Chuck Swindoll tells about two ladies that cross the border in San Diego. It happened several years ago. And it goes to, they went to Tijuana. I've been there. Been there on a mission trip, in fact. And so they go over the border in Tijuana to do some Christmas shopping. And on their way out, they heard some whimpering. And they looked down below them, and near uh, the drain, right beside the street, was a little puppy. Looks like almost a, a, a newborn, but very young Chihuahua. <laughs> I just had to hear um, Herb laugh there. A chihuahua, and it was very sick, was whimpering, and they said, we just can't leave it here to die. And so they picked up the little animal, and they said, we can't get it over the border without hiding it. And so they wrapped it up, placed it in one of their back Christmas bags, and they, no, no problem at all, it got right over the border. One of the, as they pulled up to one of them's house, they just, she just said, well, look, I'll, I'll take the little fellow. I'll nurse him back to help. So she she gave him, uh, tried to give him milk, water, wouldn't eat anything, wouldn't drink anything. Um, it was just getting worse and worse. She finally just wrapped it up in a little blanket, placed it in the bed right beside her to keep it warm at night. The next morning she woke up and he wasn't doing any better. In fact, it looks like he was about ready to go. So he took, she took the little, little dog to the vet, walks in, lays it on the table, unwraps the wrap, his eyes get this big. He said, lady, where did you get this animal? And she said, I don't want to get in trouble now. No, I'm not, you're not leaving here until you tell me where you got this animal. And she said, well, we were in Mexico, and, and uh, this little chihuahua was there. Chihuahua? This is not a chihuahua. This is a rabid Mexican river rat. You think that's funny, but if you were laying in the bed with that Mexican river, it wouldn't have been too funny. We think to ourselves, it's harmless. There's no problem with it. But then we fall to it. Legalism, not only licentiousness, which I just described, but the legalism of it all. The putting new barriers and saying, Jesus is not enough to save me. I, I've got to add something to that. I've got to add the Lord's Supper. You know, if I just take communion often enough, maybe I'll be saved. If I get baptized, if I, if I work real hard, if I'm a good husband, a good father, I mean, how in the world can somebody say they're a Christian and do this? How in the world can somebody say they're a Christian and believe that? And we, we say to ourselves, Jesus is just not enough to save me or to give me joy, or to give me the peace that I need, I need something else. And so what's the path? How do we solve all this? He says, in verse 14, he says, the problem was you're not conducting yourself in step, in line, in alignment with the truth. Verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, what he means by this, Gentile sinners is they were considered different because they didn't have the law, because they weren't among God's chosen people. But they were all sinners, 
And Paul never um, said anything different. And yet you know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. Now notice he didn't say no one is justified alone by the works of the law. He, say, he says to us, no one is justified by works at all. Now the word justification is a, a theological term, term, and it's a biblical term. And uh, just like everybody else has terms in their uh, vocation, Certainly the Bible has terms that we need to understand as well. And the word justification has to do with a legality. It's saying that in heaven, God declares you not guilty. Not makes you not guilty. Making you not guilty is regeneration. How he regenerates you on the inside with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. The word justification is simply a legal term that Jesus Christ made the payment for your sins on the cross. And when you receive him into your heart, the Bible says you are justified by your faith in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and Jesus alone can save you and only will save you. This is the word justification. It's by faith alone, not as a, work, a result of works. He says, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so we also believed in Christ Jesus, in order to justi be justified by faith in Christ, and not only by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, he talks about those words justification, but also has to do with the rightness. He's saying, look, when you're justified, you are declared not guilty. Therefore, you're in alignment with the gospel, with the truth. You line up with it. There's a rightness here. You've seen the word uh, righteousness used many, many times theologically in the Bible, and sometimes it really does mean we're living better. But in this case of justification, it means simply that we have a right alignment with God. A theological term here, again, is the word impute or put in. You can remember it that way. When you are declared not guilty before the throne of God, no more penalized for your sin, God imputes, puts in his righteousness in you, and therefore begins to be, you begin to be more holy, more sanctified. We're going to look at that uh, more in detail next week. So this is the true gospel, that Jesus alone will save you. So what do we do? We embrace the truth. We're embracing the truth, and truth cannot change. One of the values of this church, no matter what we do, what ministries we add, ministries we take away, whatever we do about uh, like building this building several years ago, changing our name, whatever, the Word of God never changes. That's a value of this church. We ask the question, what does the Bible teach? And that's the truth. And I am, I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't change that. I'm not saying I want to, but even if I wanted to, that's way above my pay grade, all right? I can't change the truth, and you can't change the truth. So we embrace it. And in this case, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that justification only comes through believing that Jesus Christ and He alone can save you based on what he did on the cross. And so that's where it begins. You stand alone on truth. You think to yourself, well, my goodness, if I, if I side with this doctrine, I'm going to be wrong. Boy, if I'm wrong, I, I, there's, there's a consequence to pay for that. It's like if you're wrong about the law of gravity and you say, I don't believe in it. I just don't believe in the law of gravity. And so you jump off a building. You're going to suffer for that, okay? Depending on how high the building is. If you do not embrace, you and I don't, do not embrace truth, we suffer for it. So it says, first of all, you embrace the truth and just say, hey, God, these things are conflicting with you. It's conflicting to shun a group of people because another group of people, it's, it's wrong to be in your, your school, your college, your high school, or at work, and you're talking to one person, you're befriending them, but another person comes along, and boy, you don't want to be, be caught with these, these type 
people. You know, they're, they're not in your economic class or whatever. So you shun them and go to your other friends because they're popular and this person is not. The same application. You stand with the truth of Jesus Christ. Then you embrace your new life. You embrace it. Look down with me in verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so I might live to God. Now, this word death can mean many, many different things in the Bible. When we're talking about death, um, a lot of people say, well, it's annihilation. And even though you'll, you'll you say not, not many, many people really believe you're just annihilated, but we talk that way. For example, when I was in school, we talk about being dead to self, and the professor gives the idea of, well, if a person's really physically dead, you can come along, you can kick them, you can punch them, you can talk about them, but they're not going to talk to you back. They're not going to punch you back. They're not going to kick you back because they're dead. Well, that sounds real good except for the fact that death in the Bible is not annihilation. It's not just being formless and void. It means separation. When you and I are dead spiritually, the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned against God, they died spiritually, and that was a separation, a separation of the soul from God. If you die physically, that is a separation of the physical body from the soul. If you die eternally, of course, that's a separation of the soul from God forever. So it's a separation. He says, I have separated myself from being bound to the law. It's not that he doesn't keep the Ten Commandments. It's not that, again, Paul never talked about, let's ignore the law of God. God, Jesus said, not, the word of God stands forever. But he was talking about that ceremonial law that separated the Jewish people in their culture. And there were all cleanliness laws, as we said. And so I've got to wash my hands in a certain way. I have to wash my clothes before I go and worship in the temple because I have to be clean to go into the temple. But Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus washed us completely by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're already cleansed. We don't need those ceremonial laws. In fact, it's an affront to God to say, I've got to go back in spite of the fact that you died for me on the cross, that your blood cleansed me from all sin. I still got to do these things in order to get cleansed. And Paul says, I've separated myself from that. And then the most famous verse probably in the book of Galatians, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law. Again, coming back, justification and righteousness, almost interchangeable uh, theologically at least. And through, through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Look, if, if I'm looking at the ceremonial law, in fact, if I'm looking at uh, obeying the, even the Ten Commandments to get me to heaven, then Christ died for nothing. I could have worked my way there. Again, the problem is I don't know when, where, where the passing grade is along the way. But he says, positionally, I was there. there in a way, when Jesus died on the cross, I was crucified with Christ. The old self was separated. It is no longer I who live, but now Christ has replaced me. And it's really talking particularly about uh, the throne of God in our life. I was sitting on the throne of God, and now Christ is on the throne of my life. I was calling all the shots in my life. In fact, it was all about benefiting me. Now it's benefiting Jesus Christ. I've left the old master and the habits and the addictions, and I've replaced it with Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. 2 Peter 1.4, great verse, by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises, so that through, through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. You say, well, it just automatically happens, right? No, again, next week we're going to look at how you grow in Christ, how we, how we actually grow. But let me just give you a little hint to it. Positionally, you are with Christ, justified by faith, 
but the righteousness that was imputed into you has not been really imparted yet. You live it out in order to have that righteousness become real in your life, for you to grow in Christ and become what you need to become after you've been born again. You've, been, you've received the power to do that. So, what, what do we do? Well, you say, well, <clears throat> I believe that if I'm pushed to take a stand for Christ, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do that. Well, maybe that you've never been, been um, placed in that situation. I know I have many times. And I do know this. If you're unprepared for it, you'll never do it. You just won't. Preparation is such a key to the whole thing. A relationship with God, growing in Christ through His Word. You see, when I know the truth, and it's not that the truth is theoretically for me out there. No, I've embraced the truth. The truth has become me. The truth has become you. When you have that to happen, and you are faced with taking a stand for Christ whether it's against temptation or the crowd, whatever it is, you compare that then to what you have, to what that temptation or that crowd can give you. But the problem is we're not prepared. I mean, how is your relationship with God? How is it right now? Listen, if you're only coming to church once a week and that's all you're doing, you'll never stand alone with God. You say, well, I don't even come once a week. Well, then you're really not going to do that. You're, you're not. You're not prepared. You don't have that relationship. Let me give you an example. Um, when my children were growing up, I feel like, I feel like we were very close. Um, I was there for their ball games and all the things that they were doing. Helped them study a little bit, a little bit. They were smarter than me, so I couldn't, couldn't do much. But I was, I was there for them to talk to. I prayed with them. But you know, they're grown up now. And none of them live in Oviedo, Florida. None of them live in almost this country, you might as well say. I mean, North Carolina, that's a long way. You know? Boston, Atlanta, all these places are far away. And there's no question in my mind that we can say we're close, and we are, but not like we were. How do I know that? Because I'm not around them every day. I don't know them like I used to know them. And so you're sitting here today and say, well, I know Christ. Man, I, I used to read the Bible every day. I used to come to church three times a week. Then you were in relationship with him, a tight relationship where you knew him. And you probably can remember the peace and the love and the joy and the long-suffering, the gentleness, meekness, kindness, self-control, and the Spirit of God working in you and a temptation will come along. Oh, I can't sacrifice my joy. I can't sacrifice my peace to do that or to go with that crowd. But now it's easier because you don't know Him as well. You say, well, I know about, I know everything about God that I used to know. I didn't say about him. You don't know him in relationship. You're, you're not in touch. You're not current. You're not there with him the way you used to be or the way you should be and never have been. And so we look at this and we say, wow, how can I take a stand alone for the gospel? How can I do that? How? How can I be in, aligned with God? You have to prepare. Just like a football player prepares for a game, just like a golfer prepares for his match, just like you prepare for a test in school, you prepare for that day when your faith will be on the line by investing your time and efforts in the Bible in prayer, and in worship. And grow not only stronger, but also be current with the Lord. Now, what about you today? You know, one of the things that God has given us 
so graciously are things that we can do in order to stay aligned current. One of the best things, maybe the leading thing, is the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And as I'm talking about this, I'm going to ask our deacons now to come forward, sit up here on the front row and get ready to do just that, to serve you the Lord's Supper today. Because Jesus said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Doing what, what he did on the cross, remember that. Do you remember what he did for you? Listen to me very carefully. What he did for you on the cross? Every time we come here, we ought to remember the body and the blood. And so filled with gratitude, but also maybe a review of all the testimonials that we would have in our own heart about how God has worked in our life. Then he said, it's not only a time that we get together to remember his death, but also it's a plumb bob in our life. It's a correction in our life. Am I aligned with God? Because Jesus, or Paul said, I should say, in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, don't partake of the Lord's Supper if you're not right with God. To do so, you get sick. And he said, many sometimes even die because what you're saying is, is I'm taking the bread and the cup. I'm testifying to those around me that I'm right with God. I'm in line with God. And so when we do this, we come to a place in our life where we say, God, uh, what is it about my life? What's on the throne of my life that I knock off? What sin do I need to forgive, be forgiven of? What person do I need to make things right with? What habit do I need to relinquish? It's a plumb bomb time, a time to get aligned with God. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, I'm going to ask you, how, how can you get aligned with God? How can you come to grips with the fact, that, wow, I really want to be current with Him. I'm not, but I want to be, and so I'm, I'm going to start doing this. Gentlemen.